What's up guys, Justin here with TheRenderingEssentials.com back with another rendering materials tutorial for you. So in today's video I wanted to talk a little bit about PBR or physically based rendering and more specifically what you need to do with these different maps that you sometimes get when you download materials online to bring into your renderings. So I wanted to talk through just what some of these maps are and how they affect the way that your renderings are going to look so that you have an idea of what to do with them once you get them. So I do want to note that I've put together a guide on PBR materials and specifically what to do with those maps that you can download by going to the renderingessentials.com slash materials. And so that's just going to talk a little bit more about these and also give you some links to some other resources as well as some places where you can download PBR materials. So again, make sure you check that out at the renderingessentials.com slash materials. Now let's go ahead and just jump into it. All right, so I don't I don't want to get super technical in here. I do link to some more technical documents in the uh, PBR materials guide, but I do want to talk just a little bit about what to do with these maps. And so to do that, you need to have a little bit of an understanding of what physically based rendering is. So it's kind of loosely defined, but basically what it is, is a method where you try to simulate the way that light actually works and the way that it bounces inside of your renderings to try to like make them look more real. Realistic. And so one of the ways that we do that is by using maps. So if you've ever downloaded materials from websites like Polygon or other places like that, you're going to notice that you're going to get a whole bunch of different images whenever you download a material. And so that's going to be the case with pretty much all PBR materials that you download. And so each one of these maps looks a little bit different and it can be a little bit confusing because if you open these up and you look at them and you kind of flip through them, there's a whole bunch of different images in here. You may be wondering, well, what's the difference between this one and this one? Or why is this one purple or um, something like that? And so what I wanted to do was kind of talk through some of the major PBR material map types and what they do. And so we'll look at these across a couple different rendering softwares depending on what they do. Um, but most rendering softwares are going to have slots for at least some of these, if not all of these. So when you first download materials, the first thing you're going to want to look for is the diffuse map. So the diffuse map is going to be the map that actually defines your texture image. So you can see how for this one, and this is most of the materials I'm using today are from Polygon. So if you want to check out some of their materials, you can check that out at the rendering essential com slash polygon um, but there are other there are other places where you can get these as well and I link to a bunch of those in the materials guide but basically what the diffuse map is is that's the map that actually defines your texture image so those are the images that we actually apply to our faces of objects um, in order to basically add the color and the texture definition in here. So if I was to take this and just render this inside of Inkscape, just as kind of a quick example, you can see how this is basically going to show up like a material has been painted on your different faces. So the diffuse map is kind of what we're going to build on top of and usually you're going to look for a usually you're going to look for a slot labeled something like texture or diffuse or even color map um, to load this into. So in Inkscape, for example, you load this into the the texture slot right here. So it's in the albedo section. So you're going to load your texture map in and that's going to define your texture inside of your renderings. And so all those are going to do is they're just going to show up as a flat material on a flat face. So if you look at these, they're, they're detailed, but if you look at like the top of this face, it just looks like a flat box. So it's not defining any kind of roughness or anything like that. It's literally just as if you took something um, like a sticker of a brick material and stuck it on this face. But that's what we're going to build off of. And then from there, we're going to build on top of that with the other maps. And so the first kind of map I wanted to talk about is the ambient occlusion map. So the ambient occlusion map is going to be a map that you have. And in this case, it's labeled AO. And what it's going to do is it's going to highlight the shadows or add details to your shadows inside of your renderings. And so depending on the kind of rendering program you have, you'll either have a slot for this or you can also add this to a material in like Photoshop um, just by overlaying this on top of the diffuse map. And so for example, 
if I fly over just a little bit inside of SketchUp, I've applied two different maps in here. Um, one is just the raw diffuse map or the texture map that's over here on the left hand side. And then on the right hand side, I've gone into Photoshop and I've overlaid the ambient occlusion map on top of that. So if we were to look at this, this is my diffuse or my color map. This is my ambient occlusion map. And you can see how it highlights the different shadows and darker areas in here. And then this is that map with the ambient occlusion map applied on top of it inside of Photoshop. And I believe I did that just by adding that on top and then selecting the multiply option for that layer. But now if we take a look at this inside of our rendering, so if I fly off to the side a little bit, you can see how on the left hand side this looks a lot flatter and uh, less detailed while this one on the right has a lot more depth associated with it because it has darker images where those shadows are. So you can see how these are much more highlighted in those dark areas. So by overlaying that ambient occlusion map you can see how you get that much darker look. Now you will note that you might lose a little bit of the color detail in here. So like for example, this has more of a like a bark material in that deep gap while this has more of a dark color. So you can see how you lost that a little bit. So you do have to be a little bit careful with your shadow detailing and how that affects your materials. A lot of this is just going to depend on what's more important to you, but you can definitely use this to highlight those textures or those shadows and make them look more realistic or more defined. So that's going to be what this is going to look like with the ambient occlusion map applied. Some rendering programs do have a specific slot for that. Other programs like Inkscape don't. So you can do this either way depending on what program you're using. So now I want to talk a little bit about the purple map, which is the normal map. So you can see how this map right here is purple and it looks kind of funny. And if you don't know what it is, you're probably like, well, why is this crazy colored map in here? Well, the normal map is used to simulate lighting on bumps and dents inside of your rendering program. So the reason it's colored is because it actually stores the up and down information in the uh, RGB or the red, green, and blue values inside of this map. So for each one of these, um, the different colors are telling the rendering program what to do with them. So if you zoom in, for example, you can see how um, all of these are different depending on how far in or out they should be. Um, and this is basically telling your rendering program how much bumpiness to simulate inside of your rendering program. And one thing to note about this is this is only simulating bumpiness, so it's not actually adding this it's not actually adding this in as geometry. So what that means is that means that this is a very high performance way to make things look more bumpy. And so if we take a look at this, if we take a look at the way that normal maps work, basically if we were to render this inside of Inkscape, so I'm just gonna fly over and look at this, you can see how Initially, these don't really look that different, right? If you fly in, you just can't really see that much of a difference just by looking at this because the effect is very subtle. So one of the better ways to really take a look at the way that the uh, rendering program is simulating the bumpiness using the normal map is to turn the material off. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go inside of Inkscape, inside of my material settings, and I'm just going to turn the image fade all the way down. So what that's gonna do is that's gonna fade out your color map or your diffuse map so that you only see the effect being created by the, uh, you only see the effect being created by the map. And so for this material right here on the right hand side, now you can see that this is simulating that bumpiness on that face. Where if I was to come in here and do the same thing with the map on the left and also turn the image fade all the way down, you can see how this one in Inkscape shows up completely flat. So on the on the right hand side, you're simulating bumpiness and materials in addition to that texture map, which makes this look more realistic. On the left hand side, you're not getting any of that. So normal maps are really good for simulating that bumpiness and adding realism in that way. So now 
I want to talk a little bit about a different kind of map. While, um, while a normal map simulates bumpiness and doesn't really do anything to your actual geometry, on the other hand, a displacement map is a map that actually moves and deforms your meshes. So what that means is that means that your rendering program is actually going to move your mesh around when it does the uh, when it does the actual rendering. So it's actually going to take this flat face. You can see how this is a flat face with the uh, with a uh, like a river rocks material applied to it, and it's actually going to move this up and down in order to simulate a non-flat surface. And so that map looks like this and it's basically just a grayscale map that's got darks and lights that basically indicate to this program how much it should move up and down various points. And so some programs have a spot for this and some don't. I found a lot of real-time programs like uh, Twin Motion and Inkscape do not, while programs like V-Ray um, do. So they have a slot in here for this. And basically what this is going to do, if we start over here, is if I take a look at this right here, which is just a flat rectangle with this material applied to it without that map, you can see how this looks very flat, right? So if I rotate down, you can't really see anything in here because that map hasn't been applied. However, what I did is I went into the material for this other one and I applied this map inside of the displacement section. So I loaded it into the displacement slot. So now if I go over to my displacement, image. So you can see how this one is actually moving the mesh up and down with the displacement map in order to create a real three-dimensional surface. So if I rotate down even more, you can see how you're really getting those ups and downs in here. And then you can adjust those by adjusting the strength of the effect using this slot right here. So you can see how if I load this as a one, and sometimes, not all the time, um, sometimes you have to reload this in V-Ray when you do this, but you can see how you can adjust this really easily using these different settings. Now the downside of a displacement map is it does deform your mesh and it does create a more realistic look, um, especially on your rough surfaces, but at the cost of a lot of performance. So if you have like a very detailed mesh or a large rendering or something like that, and you have a bunch of displacement maps in here, that's gonna take a really long time to render. So displacement maps are best used in a couple different places to maybe highlight things, but you don't don't want, for example, like way in the background to have a whole lot of displacement applied to this because it's going to make your renderings run really slow. However, this can be a really valuable way to take these surfaces that sometimes look flat and make them look three-dimensional. And so the last map that I want to take a look at is going to be really important, and that's going to be the gloss map or the roughness map. And so what that map does is that map actually determines how much light different areas of the surface are going to reflect. So if I open this up, for example, you can see how this is this map is basically showing me that in the light areas it wants to reflect light, while in the dark areas it shouldn't reflect light. And so this is going to be really important for simulating reflection inside of your room. Renderings. And so one thing I do want to note about this is depending on if you have a gloss map or a roughness map, you may need to invert this. So swap the black and white values. Most rendering programs have a slot for that. So let's go ahead and first take a look at this. So this is an example model that I've used before for rendering inside of Inkscape. But if I go ahead and I run this render and I let this load in, so if I run this rendering, you can see how this uh, material on the left does not have that gloss map applied to it, while the one on the right does, and that means I'm getting much more reflection off of this glossy mirrored tile than I would on the other one. So that gloss map is basically defining that in those white areas or those tile areas, um, light is bouncing off of those areas, while in like the grout areas, you can see how the light isn't actually coming off of those. So if you inspect this really closely, you can see how this is actually giving you that realistic rendering effect of not getting um not getting light reflected off of the grout areas. And so one thing to point out about that is in Inkscape, for example, if I was to open my material editor, if I had a roughness map, um, and you can see how I've loaded this into my, uh, down here there's actually a spot inside of your reflections to load this in. Um, 
so that's that's going to be the same in most rendering programs but you can see how I've actually come in here and I've inverted this map so um, if I uncheck the box for inverted and then I look at this rendering you can see how I'm actually not getting reflections in the tile anymore um, if anything I would be getting reflections in the grout and since they're really small I'm not really getting a whole lot of reflections in there well what I had to do is I just had to come in here and just check the box for inverted that inverts that texture and then now I've got my dark areas and so I guess in this situation the dark areas are actually showing where the re where the light would reflect not the light um, but it's really easy in most programs to invert that just by looking for the inverted option but you can see how this map is going to make it so you can really generate some realistic reflections inside of your model and if you remember I actually did a video a little while ago about adding um, a wet pavement effect on top of your gloss map inside of Photoshop so you can actually add noise to these maps as well in order to simulate different things so like if this was wet for example it would have some wet areas and some dry areas and we would just add a darker color or a lighter color to that map in order to adjust the way that the light reflects in there so that's where I'm going to end this video. Like I said, most rendering programs will have slots for most of these. So specifically, they should have slots for your diffuse map, your normal map, and your gloss map. And then depending on the program you have, it'll have other slots as well for like your ambient occlusion or displacement. That really kind of depends on the program that you're using. But you should be able to find a place for a lot of these um, no matter what program you're using. But leave a comment below. Let me know if this kind of video is helpful to you, if uh, you knew all of this already already or if you didn't know any of it. I just love having that conversation with you guys. If you like this video, please remember to click that like button down below. If you're new around here, remember to click that subscribe button for new rendering content every week. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. I really appreciate it and I will catch you in the next video. Thanks guys.